Good morning and welcome. <laughs> welcome to everyone here in this sanctuary and to those of you online. Welcome to a very special Pride Sunday at the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. We are so glad that you made time to be here with us on this Sunday for this sacred time. In this community, we strive to live with integrity, nurture wonder, and inspire the actions that will transform us and transform the world. I'm Carolyn Bierke, and I am delighted to be serving the Unitarian Society as intern minister. Lead minister, Reverend Julia Hamilton, is on sabbatical and will return in September, but today is her birthday. She may not be watching, but let's wish Julia a happy birthday. Woo! I know she feels that love. And so for this morning's service, I am honored to be here today with worship associate Ellen Broidy, uh, Matthew, Matthew Grissett, our music director, Heather Levin, pianist, and Angie Swanson, Angie Swanson Kiriako, who is engaging with our online attendees. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to any visitors or guests joining us for the first time. You are in for a treat. We would like to get to know you and welcome you into this community. On the second Sunday of the month, we have a casual newcomer orientation across the courtyard in the front office. And you can also visit the welcome table in the courtyard or join the online, online coffee hour. There is a link to the connection card online or one in the order of service that you can fill out and drop in the collection plate when it goes around. We have a lot going on beyond Sundays at USSB. And this morning, I want to highlight that the Peace and Dignity Journey, which is a 6,000 mile prayer run with two small groups of indigenous runners is going to be running through Santa Barbara on the 15th of July. One group is running from Alaska and the other group is running from Argentina and they will meet up in Colombia. And so the Northern group will be coming through here and we will be providing them with a place to sleep. USSB is also helping with the food for a community potluck, which will take place on that Monday between four and six at Ortega Park and USSB members are welcome to attend. Next Sunday, Marcos Vargas, regional coordinator for the Peace and Dignity Journey, will speak briefly about the run during this service, and he will also share more information about the run after the service. Uh, P Flag has a table in the courtyard today, so stop by and visit them. And now we have an arrange, uh, announcement from Lorraine Woodard. Good morning, everybody. You may remember that on Earth Day, I announced a new campaign to get people to do, or try to do, a household calculator, figuring out how much um, carbon your household produced, and asking people to commit to actions that would reduce their carbon footprint. So today, I'm here to announce the result of that survey, or campaign. Drum roll, Heather. That was, she's so good. <laughs> anyway, it was a worthy introduction because we saved or committed to saving 105 tons of carbon. It, it's impressive. Um, people have gotten EVs, uh, solar panels, heat pump water heaters, heat pump HVAC systems, new windows. Um, some people are doing things like eating the wonky fruit in the grocery store or committing to eating further down on the food chain. So there are a lot of things that we can do that don't take very much money, really, or, or really that much effort. So anyway, it was a great effort. I appreciate this. And to celebrate, we're having a drawing at 1115 in Parish Hall, and people who participated, their names will be drawn for some gifts that we got from local businesses. And um, there will be cookies there. You're all welcome to come. Um, I had originally thought about having cake, but then I thought, well, cake takes plates, and it takes silverware, and it takes napkins. So in my way of thinking, eating cookies is a far more ecologically sound thing to do 
and it's really the least we can do. Thank you. And now, settle into your spot, take a deep breath, and take a moment to fully arrive in this sacred space. If you're joining us in our online sanctuary and have a chalice or a candle to light, please do so and type into the chat, chalice is lit, and the name of your street or town. While we cannot see the flame, we know it is burning bright throughout our far-flung community. The words for this morning's chalice lighting are by Lori Gorgas Halban, living with pride. For those who lived their lives in closets of shame, for those who furtively visited the bars where nobody knew your name, for the Stonewall riot and the fierce trans women who fought, for the plague which still takes far too many, too young, too soon, so many gone, so many never lived to see our gay kids singing on TV, out gay people serving in the military, marriage equality, families formed by intention. We light our chalice for all these and for the siblings of the rainbow, surviving, living life out in the open with pride. And I'd like to add, we light this chalice in the hope that the flame that burns in this beloved community will help guide us through the possible dark times ahead. And those of us in the LGBT community know that no matter what, we always have a safe and loving home here. Every Sunday, we take a moment to reflect upon something good and possibly transformative we've seen in the world. We share these on chat, during coffee hour, and from the lectern. And here's my contribution for our good things jar. On June 24th, 2016, President Barack Obama, remember President Barack Obama? Okay. <laughs> President Barack Obama dedicated the Stonewall National Monument in a park across the street from the Stonewall Inn, the site of the 1969 rebellion that injected new life into the movement for LGBTQ rights. A few years after the dedication, the organization Pride Live, co-founded by two queer women of color, Diana Rodriguez and Anne-Marie Gothard, secured the lease to the storefront that had been the Stonewall's dance floor, and work began transforming this long, empty, and neglected space into a visitor center. On June 28th, 2024, 55 years to the date of the riot, a star-studded cast, including President and Dr. Biden, the New York governor, Senator Kristen Gillibrand, Elton John, Katy Perry, Elizabeth Alexander of the Mellon Foundation, and two wonderful women who made this dream a reality, officially opened the Visitor Center, the first LGBTQ visitor center in the National Park Service system. Among the list of partners supporting the Visitor Center, although the list of partners supporting the Visitor Center is long and impressive, a few stood out to me as examples of how far we've come. These include Major League Baseball, Google, the Mellon Foundation, the NLF, the NBA and the WNBA, SAG-AFTRA, Amazon, AARP, and the multiple missing names, an example of how far we still need to go. But it was a wonderful ceremony and a beautiful, beautiful visitor center. I wanted to share that with you this morning.
And now please rise in body or spirit to join in singing our opening hymn, Sing Out Praises for the Journey. children with us this morning. Ah, I see a couple back there. Come on up. I see Dylan back there. Come on up, Dylan. Dylan, is your mom here? Are you wearing your fabulous outfit, Sarah? Will you come up and be a visual aid for our story? And Chuck, you can be a visual aid too. I mean, how could we not invite Sarah up? She got, she got that at Fashion Fling, just a plug for Fashion Fling. Ooh, okay. Our story this morning is called, Twas the Night Before Pride. Twas the night before pride, a warm evening in June, all the people got ready with the rise of the moon. The drag queens all brushed their wigs with great care, and the bikers checked their tires to make sure they had air. All across the city, people's outfits were planned and instruments polished for the queer marching band. My mom told us all, we should go to bed early. She's that kind of mom who's more boyish than girly. While Mama finished packing our snacks in a bag, baby Sammy started chewing on the edge of our flag. As I finished my sign, which I laid on the floor, I remembered the prides I'd been to before. All day we will walk in the streets up and down. Pride's one of the best celebrations around. There are floats and loud music and rainbows and glitter. Last year, we ran into our babysitter. Tomorrow will be baby Sammy's first pride. Can we tell the whole story? I hopefully cried. So we sat on the couch, a mom on each side, and took turns telling the tale of the very first pride. A long time ago in 1969, there wasn't a pride march. It was a less fair time. Queer people all over of each shape and size didn't have any rights recognized. So much of their lives they had to keep hidden 
Even their clothing was sometimes forbidden. Stonewall was a place where it was safe to be proud, but police would storm in to say this wasn't allowed. So one hot night in June, people stopped being quiet. They decided to fight and started a riot. More and more gathered to fight back in the heat. Some started a kick line in the middle of the street. Police broke up the crowd night after night, but the people stood strong knowing this wasn't right. And so it began, a march that spread worldwide to show everyone it's good to have pride. It sometimes happens we're not given respect. It can take a long time for some to accept. That's why every year we all gather together and march in the streets, no matter the weather. To know that we matter, to show all we exist and that any oppression we must always resist. So pride's not just about tutus and rainbow suspenders. It's about rights for queers and all our beautiful genders. Pride's a day that is crowded. It's a day that is long. It's a day that means together we are strong. As I closed my eyes, I thought of pride's past. Pride means to me, being yourself is a blast. So tomorrow I will march with my family and cheer. Happy pride to all. It's great my family is here. <laughs> Dylan, do you want to take this out? Take it out with Jimmy. And our kids are going to head out now and they are going to be make, preparing, our kid, <laughs> and they're going to prepare, be preparing a rainbow pride salad that we, you can enjoy with your cookies from, that Lorraine is providing. <laughs> so enjoy that after the service too. Thank you. We hold you in our love as you go, as you go. May your heart be at peace as you go. To nurture the spark of your precious life, we hold you in our love. I now invite you into a few moments of stillness and meditation. Breathe in deeply, down into your core. Letting your breath fill you up and then breathe out completely. Slowly and consciously completely releasing on your exhale. Sink further into yourself as you surrender to the soft, slow rhythm of your breathing. Let your breath bring you here to this present moment where you can feel the wholeness of you. Breathe in pride for the glorious human you are right now. Breathe in gratitude for all that you have faced and will face. Breathe in unconditional acceptance for the perfectly imperfect person you are. Others will surely judge. The world will try to have its say but breathe and stay grounded in yourself, finding the courage to be you. In your thoughts, may you be you.
in your words, may you be you. In your actions, may you be you. Amen. I've done a lot of these reflections, and I don't think I've ever been quite as, I don't know if nervous is the word, so bear with me, please. The older I get, the more attached I become to ritual and repetition. The stories we tell at Christmas and Hanukkah, Easter and Passover, the special incantations to mark the turning of the seasons, the flower communion and water ceremonies. The content of these services remains both comfortably consistent and refreshingly new with each retelling. I feel much the same way about pride. It's a story worth retelling so that each new generation understands battles won and lost and how much there's still left to do. In the retelling, we keep our history vibrant, alive, and accurate especially important considerations in these troubling times. I wanna go back 55 years to the weekend of June 28th, 1969. I was on Fire Island then with my partner Linda and four older, wiser, and way more settled friends. Little did any of us imagine as we took our morning beach walk that hours earlier, our world and the world of many LGBTQ people had been turned on its head. Remember, this was a far, far less connected time. We lacked the myriad social media platforms and ready access to information and disinformation we now take for granted. Yet by Saturday morning, most of Gay Fire Island buzzed with the news that something quite extraordinary had happened at the Stonewall Inn a mafia-run bar on Christopher Street in New York's Greenwich Village. It suddenly seemed as if lightning had struck, and each of us, in our own way, understood that life, as we both loved it and feared it, would never be the same. In the city, I staffed the counter at the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop, the first bookstore catering exclusively to the LGBTQ community and conveniently for me, located in the heart of New York University. I'd spent most afternoons and many weekends volunteering at the bookshop since its opening in 1967 and considered it, along with the NYU gay student group, my political home. Craig Rodwell, the bookshop's founder, became a close friend and while our politics did not always align, he was an out and proud gay person, just the sort of role model I needed as an awkward 23-year-old. That summer, I attended the meetings of the Gay Liberation Front, GLF, which had been organized immediately after Stonewall. While equally committed to the fight for lesbian and gay rights, the discussions at GLF and the post-Stonewall conversation that swirled around Craig and the bookshop seemed to take place on parallel, rarely intersecting tracks. I was forced to face the difference between a struggle for individual rights and GLF's insistence on a revolutionary, collective movement for wider human liberation. I encountered personal and political challenges in attempting to reconcile the two. I found myself navigating the competing currents of the nascent lesbian and gay movement. I learned about the demonstrations called annual reminders that took place in front of the White House and later at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Organized by leaders of what was then called the homophile movement, brave men and women protested in broad daylight, faces exposed, names known, to demand protection from arbitrary dismissal from government, employees, government employment of out or suspected homosexuals. These demonstrations, quite mild by today's standards, were radical for their time. And I make this point both to honor the courage of the people who took to the streets when few dared, as well as to own up 
to my own subsequent role, subsequent role in denigrating and demeaning much of what they did as being too straight, too accommodationist, too narrowly establishment. In November of 1969, the Eastern Regional Conference of Homophile Organizations, or ERCO, was slated to meet in Philadelphia. At the time, I was the, quote, president of the gay students group at NYU, an active member of the Gay Liberation Front, and part of the informal, by which I mean unpaid, staff at the Oscar Wilde Bookshop. In short, I belonged everywhere and nowhere in the queer universe, but I was determined to be in Philadelphia to somehow participate in framing our future. But then, at a get-together with friends, I was handed the opportunity to play a small yet pivotal role in our history. The night before we were to head to Philadelphia, Linda and I had dinner with Craig Rodwell and his partner, Fred Sargent. When the conversation turned to the upcoming meeting, we began to talk about the earlier annual reminders. With all the ego, bluster, and callousness of youth, I disparaged the work of the brave women and men who mounted the action, making fun of their dress code, always men in suits, women in dresses. And I have to say, the first time I did this talk to a class, I said, always women in suits, men in dresses. So, <laughs> I was aspirational at that point. Okay. So, to enter my newly radicalized mind, their limited objectives. My bluster was contagious because within minutes, Craig had a pad and pen at the ready and we set about drafting a resolution to turn the annual reminder into a march for liberation, move it to New York City and hold it the next year on the last weekend in June to commemorate and celebrate the Stonewall Rebellion and to help nurture the radical political movement we were confident would emerge from it. Craig was a remarkable man, a visionary in many ways, but he was also a lightning rod. He attracted as much derision as praise, and he was painfully, painfully aware of that. We were concerned that if he presented the resolution, some in attendance would judge the speaker and not the speech. Although the resolution was a collective undertaking, Craig was the prime mover. Political animal that he was, he knew the risks involved if he spoke, and felt in his gut that this was too important to have personal animus scuttle a magnificent idea. So we decided that I would present the proposal to the conference the next day. While I had chaired the NYU students group meetings and occasionally spoken up at GLF, I was neither by nature nor inclination at ease in public speaking. However, like Craig, I understood the significance of the revolution, excuse me, of the resolution and the revolution, and the gravity of the moment. Swallowing my hesitation, I stood in the middle of the conference circle and presented our proposal for a full out march for liberation and social transformation. The march would mark the significance of the June 1969, June 1969 at Stonewall and highlight the work of the Gay Liberation Front, which more than any other organization understood the possibility, the necessity of turning a moment into a movement. No one was surprised when members of the GLF contingent were the first to shout, right on, the verbal equivalent of unbridled support in 1969. <laughs> the June 1970 march was just that, a march, a group of marginalized people taking it to the streets. No floats, no corporate sponsors, no phalanx of police marching with us as if this were some strange and alternative version of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Crowds lined the sidewalks, stood at windows and fire escapes. We had no idea whether they would cheer us on or to do us harm. It was in equal parts thrilling and terrifying, but mostly it was life affirming. We were in the streets to demand rights and liberation across multiple oppressed communities. And I'm so proud to say that my ragtag band of sisters and brothers from GLF, now in our 70s and 80s, continue to march for, to work for, to demand liberation for all people. And should things go badly in our country, please know that we'll be on the line of march and at the barricades, just as we were that June day over half a century ago. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. I think you're applauding for my having gotten through it. <laughs> I'd like to invite my spouse of many, many decades, not quite over half a century, but almost Joan Ariel to lead the offertory and tell you a little bit more about the special family we are supporting. Joan. What a history. I'm still in awe after 45 years, I tell you. Woo. Okay, good morning. <laughs> Happy Pride on Stonewall 55. Every week, USSB donates 25% of our Sunday offering to support special projects and community partners that share our deepest values. On this last Sunday of June, we conclude our offertory celebration of the newly established USSB Immigration Justice Fund. Our first very special recipient family, lesbian moms Christina and Luz, and their six-year-old daughter Sophia, visited from their home in Stockton last weekend for solstice and joined us for services last Sunday. They love coming to services when they're in town, handily using Google Translate to follow along with the reflections and the sermons. We hope some of you were able to meet them during coffee hour. Over the past month, we've shared some of their stories, reflecting both the extraordinary resourcefulness and resilience they've demonstrated since they crossed the border legally in April 2022, and reflecting our profoundly broken immigration system. Our last story goes back to the beginning of their time in Stockton and our efforts to find a way to safely transfer funds to them we quickly, we quickly learned that one cannot get a bank account in this country without official ID, which they did not have. They only recently received a federal ID number when their work permits arrived. It's supposed to take 30 days for work, permits ap work permit applications to be processed. But at the June 9th service, Ellen reported that it took this time two full years. On the June 16th service, John Altman described their initiative and resourcefulness this past January when they went to the Mexican consulate in Sacramento and obtained Mexican passports, which surprisingly allowed them to open an account at the Bank of America. However, for the first year and a half, getting funds to them in Stockton was a real challenge. Soon after learning the hard way, that using Western Union was extremely cumbersome and exorbitantly expensive, Sherry Runge made a brilliant suggestion at a justice and equity team meeting um, in late 2022. Might there be a Unitarian congregation in Stockton that could help us out? Sure enough. A quick internet search led to the first Unitarian Universalist Church of Stockton. Reverend Julia reached out to their Reverend Matthew Pargeter Villarreal, who put us in touch with their social justice committee. And Dick Abood, a committee member, quickly offered to help. Thus began a wonderful year-long partnership with the two of them, as I could easily send Dick funds each month via Venmo which he or Reverend Matt delivered to Christina and Luz. When Christina and Luz were able finally to open their own bank account early this year, and I set up an interbank transfer with no fees attached, our Stockton UU partners were delighted. Reverend Matt sent me a reply when I let him know this, saying the following. Happy New Year, Joan. This is wonderful news to start off the new year. Even if our intermediary services are no longer needed for providing funds to Luz and Christina, please keep us posted of everything that's going on with them. I love this part. Although they have yet to attend services at our church, <laughs> they are Catholic. <laughs> We're happy to be a lifeline to them in the Stockton area should they need it. Blessed be. It's hard to imagine how this could have worked across 
the 352 mile distance without our amazing Stockton Unitarian partners. We can't begin to express how deeply grateful we are for their compassionate and generous assistance. Blessings indeed abound. Please give as generously as you are able in this last June offertory. We would also be grateful if you might join us in spreading the word to friends and family. They too can make a real difference with donations now tax deductible through the new Immigration Justice Fund link on the USSB website. For those of you at home, the text to give number appears on your screen. Please join me in saying the affirmation of gratitude and giving. Let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. Let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us, for we are enriched by their giving. And let us be grateful even for our needs so that we may learn from the generosity of others. song we're about to sing was written by Jackson Brown and Leslie Mendelson for a 2018 documentary called 5B. At the heart of the HIV and AIDS crisis in the 1980s and the widespread hysteria, a single number and letter designated a ward on the fifth floor of San Francisco General Hospital, 5B, the first ward in the country designed specifically to serve AIDS patients. The unit's nurses' emphasis on humanity and consideration of holistic well-being was a small miracle amid a devastating crisis and the ensuing panic about risk and infection. The documentary 5B provides a beautiful tribute to these incredible nurses and other staff and volunteers of 5B. The song is called a human touch. You can call it a decision. I say it's how we're made. There's no point in shouting from your island, proclaiming only Jesus saves. There will always be suffering. There will always be pain. Because of it, there will always be love. And love, we know it will remain. Everybody gets lonely. Like it's all too much Reaching out for some connection Or maybe just their own reflection Not everybody finds it Not like the two of us Sometimes all anybody knows a human touch Everybody wants a holiday Everybody wants to feel the sun Get outside and run around Live like they're forever young Everybody wants to be beautiful Live life their own way No one ever wants to let it go No matter what they do or say Everybody gets lonely Feel like it's all too much Reaching out for some connection 
or maybe just their own reflection. Not everybody finds it, not like the two of us. Sometimes all anybody needs is a human touch. Sometimes all anybody needs is a human touch. All anybody needs is a human touch. Beloved community, at UU General Assembly last week, the vote to approve Article 2 was held and it overwhelmingly passed. Woohoo, yeah. For those of you who may not be familiar with the changes in the Article 2 bylaws, they replace the principles with a set of values that maintains the equal parts of the principles without being hierarchical. And they place love at the center. To me, this is a truly beautiful expression of what it means to meet the moment in this faith community that we call a living tradition. Affirming that we know that religion is an ongoing practice of articulating and working again and again to live into our highest aspirations within community, to live in right relationship with the earth, to steward the wisdom and address the harms of our ancestors, and to do our best to shepherd into being a world where freedom and flourishing are lived realities for all of our descendants. We did not vote in new values with this historic ballot or vote out old ones. We did, as a democratic body of engaged and faithful people, adopt a new articulation of our most cherished and longest held commitments for ourselves as individuals, as communities, as interconnected strands of the web of all existence. For this moment that we are in, the words we chose are, are our best attempt at naming our highest aspirations for ourselves as a people. And yes, it is imperfect and incomplete, and they are a charge to ourselves, calling us forward today and for however long we choose to embrace these particular words into the unceasing practice of love. This commitment to placing love at the heart of all we do 
is one reason that being together today on USSB's Pride Sunday is so very special. As we recognize the endless work that folks have done to create change and inclusion in the Santa Barbara community and US, at USSB over the years, there is much to celebrate. As Ellen was fighting to change the world with so many others on the East Coast, Many of you have been working for years for LGBTQ plus rights right here in California, working to make sure USSB was welcoming to all. And for this work and sacrifice, seen and unseen, and much of it unacknowledged, I say thank you. And we are all grateful. Black feminist author, Bell Hooks said, the moment we choose to love, we begin to move towards freedom to act in ways that liberate ourselves and others. This act of love that she describes is one that when we choose it, we begin to head in the direction of freedom. Our choice to love initiates a journey towards liberation. And she also said, the ability to acknowledge blind spots can emerge only as we expand our concern about the politics of domination and our capacity to care about the oppression and exploitation of others. A love ethic makes this expansion possible. It is in this awareness and acknowledging of those blind spots and knowing that we can move forward towards a world where everyone has the freedom to be themselves, that there is capacity for growth and change. Isn't that a beautiful path? We acknowledge with humility and sometimes sadness that we aren't there yet, recognizing that our experiences have shaped us and that there is so much more that we don't know or understand. I was very fortunate growing up because my parents gave me a gift. They didn't make me feel like I was being judged. I felt like I could choose to be whatever I wanted to be. And that was a gift that I wasn't even aware of. My parents let me have the freedom to pursue my own path in life. And this normalized a sense of acceptance for myself and in turn others. This early experience, it's helped me to influence my role as a parent, especially when I've had to recognize some of my own blind spots. And it has helped me to let go of my ideas and dreams for my children when they had different ones. And this was very useful because my life experience growing up was of a binary world with very little awareness of those different from me. And as it turned out, my kids have a variety of gender and sexual identities. One thing that I have learned is when a child or a young adult comes out, it's likely they've been thinking about it for a long, long time. If it takes us as parents by surprise, it may take some time to catch up. Maybe we had a blind spot. And because coming out is such a deeply vulnerable act, it is really important that we meet that moment with love. And in love, we create the freedom for more people to live a more authentic life. Sometimes people say that authenticity, authenticity is our true currency. How can we show up as our true authentic selves when faced with limiting beliefs? Being authentically ourselves is a vulnerable place. And if we haven't had those spaces to feel safe to explore, we can't do it. One of the beautiful places where that authenticity can be nurtured is in using someone's correct pronouns. I have heard everything from it's too hard to remember to it's, it's not proper English. It is an act of love to call someone by their chosen pronouns. It gives them a chance to feel seen and to feel authentic. It's okay if you get them wrong, apologize. But if you value, as Bell Hooks said, 
acting in ways that liberate ourselves and others, choose love and use the right pronouns. That's where pride comes in. The glitter blessing, decorations and music are all part of a wonderful celebration and it creates an atmosphere of welcome and joy that says you can be authentic here. I want our, new, our youth to know that from the moment they are born. I want them to know that they can be open in their exploration and questioning. They don't have to live within a binary perspective. Life is change and they can be fluid in their identity. They don't have to hide who they are or suffer a fear of rejection. That is my prayer. And let us not forget that while some places have created spaces of freedom and acceptance, many do not. My kids have had acceptance to a great extent, but there have been times when I've had to advocate for them with teachers and administrators in their schools or with their friends' parents where I felt that they wouldn't be safe from harm. I feel that because we live in California that it can be easy to forget that this is not the reality for much of the rest of the country. We must remember places like Florida and Texas where kids don't have a chance to explore who they are because of oppression. Their joy and authenticity are actively threatening to be extinguished. Side with Love, a UU advocacy network is helping youth and families move to places where they can live in freedom. And this battle is ongoing. When we commit to placing love at the center of all we do, we are called to action. It calls us to support and to uplift those who are still fighting for their right to be themselves. It calls some of us to be allies, to educate ourselves, to challenge prejudices and stereotypes and to create spaces where everyone can feel safe and valued. It calls us to check our blind spots. As we celebrate pride today, we know that this celebration is not just about the joy and glitter and music. It is about the celebrating the work that has to be done and recognizing the work that still needs to be done. I think I'm gonna have some slides here. On the screen are some of the first couples married when the Marriage Equality Act was upheld by the Supreme Court on July 26, 2015. These pictures came from the Washington Post and that fabulous day, uh, one, of my, one of the couples is my brother Tim and his husband Peter. The joy in these pictures is overflowing and is an affirmation of progress. We honor the pioneers of the LGTP, LGTP, LGBTQ plus rights movement like Ellen. Yes, sorry. Like Ellen and those who fought and continue to fight for equality and justice. We honor the sacrifices made, the lives lost and the progress achieved. We honor the communities that support and uplift each other in the face of adversity, and we honor the courage and resilience of those who have come out and those who are still finding their way. In our own congregation, we have seen the power of love and acceptance. We have seen the difference it makes when we create spaces where people can be themselves. We have seen the joy and freedom that come from living, living authentically. And we have seen the impact of our collective efforts to create a more inclusive and welcoming community. As we move forward, let us do so with love at the center of all we do. Let us choose love in our interactions with each other, in our advocacy and activism. Let us also remember that you are not alone in this work. We are part of a larger community, a larger movement that is committed to creating a world where everyone can be their true, authentic selves. On this Pride Sunday, let us celebrate the progress we have made and also recommit ourselves to the work that still needs to be done. May we go forward knowing that we choose to put love in the center of all we do. And may we create a world where everyone feels welcomed, 
valued, and free to be themselves. Blessed be. Now we are going to have a glitter blessing. Um, we recognize this, this blessing is a recognition of the sacred beauty inherent in every person. Glitter has long been a symbol for the LGBTQ plus movement of gritty, sparkly hope in the face of prejudice and oppression, of joy and pride in the face of hatred and bigotry. Glitter is resilient and tenacious. And the briefest beam of sunlight causes it to shine out even in the dustiest and dreariest of places. And its beauty comes from its brokenness. Glitter sparkles because it is, it, it is many different broken pieces coming together, changing in every moment as the light changes. This glitter that we share with each other today is a reminder that each of us is beautiful in our sacred imperfection our ever-changing selves, and our glorious plurality. As Heather plays True Colors, you are invited to come forward starting at the rear. Show us where on your face, neck, arm, or hand you would like to receive your glitter blessing, and then circle back to your seat. If you cannot come forward today and wish to receive this blessing, please raise your hand and one of us will come to you. All right, let's sparkle.
I invite you to pause with me as we come to a close of this ritual. Look around at all the beautiful shining faces here and online and at the amazingness of our blessed bodies gathered in sacred space together. Everybody in this space and beyond is a holy being. Every person is a sacred being made of stardust. Just take a moment to notice how extra glittery, glittery we are, how fabulous we are. And now please join in rise and body your spirit and join in singing our closing song, Draw the Circle Wide. As, I, as we go forth, I offer you this final blessing. May you receive and shine with love everywhere you go and know in your deepest heart and in every day you matter and you belong. 
May you hold on to hope and your inner sparkle even when discouragement and despair beckons. Together, may we make this a place of welcome and healing. Together, may we be a sparkling force of love that our world needs. Blessed by this community and by the divine, go forth and celebrate with pride. Blessed be. Now let's call out a blessing. Call out a blessing, call out a blessing, call out a blessing, call out, call out a blessing, call out a blessing, call out a blessing, call out, call out. Call.